So, um, my name is Fuad Yusuf. I um, am from Toronto. I work at the I work at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, when I started, I worked uh, for the, the sequencing production team, and I was responsible for the assembly of the the white brand pipeline. One of them was going to sequencing. So I did that for uh, three years, and then I moved to another team. Uh, right now, where I do uh, more analysis, I do biomarker discovery, algorithm development. But at the same time, I still uh, uh, come up with uh, QC tests and metrics that we can use to assess the performance of a lot of the libraries and samples that we uh, work with. Um, so today, we're going to be continuing with the uh, RNA-seq lectures. And in this module, uh, I'll focus on the alignment aspect of uh, uh, RNA-C and, um, and also uh, visualization, how to visualize those aligned uh, files. So some of the uh, objectives that uh, we want to learn at the end of this module uh, is the, uh, some of the challenges. So what were the challenges that we, uh, we face when, when it comes to RNA-C uh, alignment? Uh, and go over the different alignment strategies that are available. Uh, and what, what suits uh, your, your data. Also, the, uh, go over the tools that we've picked for uh, the, the assignments and for the tutorial, which is a combination of uh, Bowtie and, and Top Hat, uh, and also talk about other, other alternatives. And um, I'll go over some uh, uh, how, how the BAM files, or the alignment files, uh, are formatted for those of you who have not seen uh, a BAM file before and how you can manipulate the uh, BAM files uh, as well. Um, again, as I said, we can go over also RNC visualization through IGB. Uh, and another section that I'll be doing is the uh, QC assessment. So some of, the, some of the, uh, the questions that you asked in the first module about uh, how much sequencing do we, do we need, how, do we, how can we tell if the library is good or bad, uh, I'll get to cover uh, those in more details uh, there. I'll show you what, what uh, metrics you need to work with and, and how you uh, do proper assessment. And uh, finally, just a small section on data read count. If you're trying to look for variants in uh, RNA-seq data, then I'll show you how to do that as well. So what are some of the challenges that RNA-seq uh, uh, data analysis uh, uh, face? Um, one of the biggest ones is the computational cost. I mean, as sequencing technology is advancing, we're getting uh, the sequencers that will give us more reads, more depth, and also the length of the reads uh, are, are increasing. And with that comes uh, computational uh, uh, cost. So, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, one length of sequencing uh, with the HiSeq 2000, uh, just about 300 million reads. I have seen actually more reads now. There's the HiSeq 2500. Uh, I've, I've seen actually up, up to 500 million reads per uh, per lane, uh, so that's that's a lot of reads uh, to process. And add uh, another layer of complexity compared to the DNA with the RNA, you actually have introns. So it's the challenge of trying to identify uh, the intron, the intron exon uh, splice sites and exon exon boundaries, which is something that you don't really have with DNA sequencing. Um, and with RNA sequencing, uh, you get a lot of data. So, yes. Sorry, uh, this is a very naive question, but when you do RNA, you don't have the intron sequence at all, right? You have no data. Exactly, but I'm talking about the challenge that you face when you try to align it. Okay. And we'll go over, uh, yeah, uh, right, over, right. over that. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, the RNA sequences, they do not have any intron regions, but when you try to map them, uh, that's one of the challenges that you face. Um, and in addition to expression, RNA-seq is more than just expression data. I mean, RNA-seq is expression. You can also call variants from RNA-seq. RNA uh, you can do splice variants. You can do uh, fusion detection. So um, in each one of these uh, different data types, they come with a package or like a, a list of packages uh, and tools uh, that, that get updated often. So you can't just pick one, one tool that will do everything for you. You will have to use a variety of tools uh, to get all that information. Um, throughout the, uh, the talk, you'll also see links from Biostars, uh, which you were introduced to earlier today. Um, so here, for example, the question is, top hat the only mapper considered for RNA-seq uh, data? I'll go over some other uh, uh, options as well. But uh, if you go there, you'll see a discussion of 
uh, what other aligners uh, are available in the community. So when it comes to um, the strategies that you can pick for the alignment, there are three main strategies that you can choose from. So you have the Dino Health Assembly, uh, you have the, uh, the option to align to a transcriptome preference, or you can align to a whole uh, genome reference. Now, how do you pick? So for de novo assembly, it's, it's good if you do not have uh, a reference genome, a known reference genome. So if you're dealing with a species that doesn't have a reference genome, then you go with that option. Also, uh, it's, it's a good choice if you have a complex uh, polymorphism uh, and mutation, and you think that if you align to a reference genome, you might miss that uh, completely. So you, you would go with de novo assembly. Unfortunately, we're not going to be doing any de novo assembly in this course. Um, and uh, instead, we're going to be focusing on uh, uh, alignment to a uh, whole genome reference. But what can, you can also do is you can align to a, trans, a transcriptomic reference. So you assemble all the isoforms, all the possible isoforms into one reference, and then you take your reads and just align them to the transcriptomic reference. And that usually works, uh, uh, works well if you have short reads uh, uh, as well. Um, with with a ref, whole, ref, whole uh, uh, genome reference uh, alignment, you can, um, you probably need longer reads. So usually what we do is we do carrot and uh, 2 by 100. Uh, that's what people do nowadays. Old data sets, they used to be uh, shorter. I've seen 2 by 30. And I think that's what we'll be using in an integrated assignment later today just for the sake of uh, uh, speed uh, processing. Uh, but you, can, you might also see a 2 by 50 for older, older data set. But most of the data sets that you will uh, encounter, uh, the recent ones are 2 by 100 at least. So this is a list of uh, uh, the, the, the aligners that are uh, available uh, along with the timeline when uh, they were released. So in terms of RNA, there are uh, a few uh, aligners that, uh, that are available. I personally have only worked with uh, Top Hat. And Top Hat is uh, very established. It's been uh, uh, it was published back in 2009. And it's been used in uh, many uh, publications. Uh, it has a, a very uh, well documentation, uh, and the, the fact that it's, it's, it's been in use for such a long time means that um, a lot of the questions that you were thinking of, we will probably see an answer in Firestar or any other, or, or on their website. Uh, so there will always be an answer uh, for, for these questions. Now the other uh, aligner that, uh, that is pretty recent is, is STAR. It's, it's known to be a, a lot faster than, uh, than Top Hat. I personally haven't done any comparison to check uh, the uh, output and see the concordance between the uh, splice junctions that are generated from Top Hat versus STAR. Uh, and I'm not aware of uh, any uh, papers that, uh, that, that do such a thing. Um, but for, for this uh, workshop, we're going to be looking at Top Hat. We're using Top Hat. We'll also have uh, STAR as an option. Uh, you, can, uh, you can run it uh, if we have time. Now, uh, back to the question that was brought up earlier. So, um, introns. So, introns, we, uh, uh, introns are a challenge because we're trying to not read that do not contain introns, their uh, mRNA sequences, to a whole, uh, whole genome uh, reference. Um, and the whole genome does not, uh, sorry, the, the whole genome can, contains introns. So, you have to, if you're aligned to whole genome, you need to pick a tool that is uh, splice junction aware. And so, uh, top hat is uh, splice junction aware uh, mapper, and it uses um, bow tie as its main aligner. So what it does is it takes the read and then it tries to map it using using bow tie, and then um, the the and then top hat takes the mapping information from bow tie and it tries to assemble those reads to come up with splice junctions. So I'm going to walk you through uh, an, a, an example of how this is done. So let's say that you have two reads, read X and read Y. And this is the reference. And the reference here, we're looking at uh, two exons, exon 1 and exon 2. And let's say that read X um, actually spans two exons, while read Y only spans one exon. And they're both the same, the same length. So what, what happens in bow tie top, top hat is that the first step is uh, alignment. 
So it takes all the reads that you have in your data uh, and then tries to align it to the, uh, to the whole genome reference. So in this case, uh, because read Y spans exon Y, it's going to perfectly align to the exon with no trouble. It takes that and puts it in the line there. Then read X. It's going to try to align it, but then it will align to exon uh, 2 with so many mismatches because of the entronic region of the whole genome. So what it does is that it, it struggles with it and puts it into an un unaligned bed. Then it takes all the reads that it put into the unaligned bed, and then it splits them into smaller chunks. Um, so if your read was 100 uh, bases, usually the default is 25 bases. So it usually splits it into four, uh, sort of 25 uh, segments. And then it takes each one of these segments and then it does the same thing. So again, bow tie, which is a short, uh, map, uh, short read aligner, will take each one of these and then it will map it again to the whole gene reference. So in this case, X1 and X3 will map perfectly. X2 will not because it's spanning again the splice junction. So it, it does that and then it well, then top hat collects all that map, mapping information from X1, X3, and X2. And it uses that to come up with a dictionary of all the possible splice junction sites in your data. And then it goes back and it tries to realign your original read according to that dictionary that it came up with. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, why does the sub Because um, so previously, if you did not uh, break the read into smaller chunks, um, you're going to end up with half of the read matching, and then the other half is going to be completely mismatched. So it, will be it will not because you cannot split a read, oh. right? So it will it will it will say that. Uh, this many bases are in, in, inserted or, or, or mismatched. Um, and the point of doing this exercise is you, you're trying to figure out where the boundary is, where exactly is that site where the splice actually happens. Um, and you're aligning it with what? The reference genome? Whole, whole genome. Yeah, so it's not but if you have the short reads, then when you have the short reads, you have lots of Exactly. So, so what you want is you don't want it to go too short. So it will keep that in mind because if it will map to multiple places, then it, it considers the other parts that it, it's not. Um, but the shorter the shorter it will be, the less unique the alignment will be. So you don't want you don't want to go too short. Um, there are short leaves that are two different colors, the short ones and the short ones. Yeah. Then align to nothing, right? They will align to yes, yeah. yeah. They'll never align to anything because they should yeah, because of the splice. Yeah, yeah. Now, but what it does is it will go back and realign all these the original reads. So the purpose of just doing that is to detect where the splice happens. But it will go back and take the original read and then map it to the dictionary that we came up with. So the the, the mapping information for these small checks is not used in the final map. It's just a way to detect where the splice is happening. Yes. So it's a Sorry, could you repeat the yeah. expression? Sorry. Yeah, so you were saying that what if there was a small exon that is 50 bases or less, is that, or how long was it? Yeah, it's like really small exon. Yeah, between the two. And it's like you consider to want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, But then you also have alternate splicing and other thing, right? So it's saying you have three exons, one, two, and three, and there are introns there are introns in between. Right. And so now what do you have alternate splicing for that? You have all that information. Yeah, so the same the same thing happens. I mean, your read has to be long enough to cover the two splice sites. And if it's if it doesn't, then you will you will miss it. And then keep in mind that you, you will have a lot of reads, not just one read that uh, will go over that site. I mean, 
you, the whole region should be covered um, with uh, enough reads to cover the, the, the two junctions. And if you're not covering these two, then there is either you should go back and check if it's a technical error, then you haven't covered that sequence, or maybe that isoform is not expressed, and that's why you're not, you're not getting reads uh, on that. Because this is just an example, but in, 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 in real data, you'll have like Long transcript oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this is a very basic example. Yeah. I mean, right. and it's not those, as two. yeah. So I think on average there are five exons, okay. four or five exons per per gene, um, uh, and yeah, and then you'll get different combination of exons. So depending on the isoform that's being expressed, sometimes it's exon one, three, four. Sometimes it's one, four, five, and, and so on. So, any more questions? Okay. All right, so um, one other issue that uh, you might face is the, uh, the multi-map uh, tweet. So these are reads that will map to multiple uh, locations. Uh, with DNA sequencing, a lot of times what happens is that you end up picking the, the top uh, or the read that has the highest mapping quality, and you just keep that. Uh, but sometimes you also end up with multiple reads that have the same exact uh, quality. Uh, and then, then you have different options of dealing with that. You can either randomly pick uh, one of those reads uh, and, and use it. In RNA analysis, I mean, you face the same issue. The way you deal with it uh, could be slightly different. It really depends on what you're doing. If you're trying to do variant column from RNA-seq, uh, it's preferred that you, you only keep one of these uh, reads, that multi map. But if you're doing expression analysis then, uh, and fusion detection, it's, it's good if you keep all these uh, different reads because they could belong to different uh, uh, homologs uh, or, or gene homologs in your, in your uh, genome, and that might alter the uh, expression if you actually get rid of uh, those reads. Um, so after you align, you end up with uh, a SAM file, which stands for a sequence alignment map format. How many people have actually seen a SAM file or worked with a SAM file? Okay. Okay. <laughs> good, good. Uh, so so um, um, the BAM is just the binary version of the, the SAM file. So I'm, uh, and, and to convert from SAM to BAM, uh, you use, you, there are many tools that you can use. One of them is SAM tools. Uh, you, can, you can take it uh, from SAM, SAM to level to BAM. And, and that will save you a lot of space. It will uh, reduce the footprint of the, of the file. And you can always go back to the SAM if you want to uh, from your BAM file. So based on the same between the DA and RNA? Yes. Okay. Same, same formats, uh, same, same files. Uh, get generated. I mean, you also get other uh, fi uh, output files uh, that tell you the splice junction uh, of where they are, and I believe they have insertion deletion uh, files as well, some, some secondary uh, files uh, in the output. But the main file that we're interested in, the alignment file, is exactly the same format as uh, DNA. So this is an example of uh, a SAM file for those of you who haven't seen SAM. Um, and uh, it, it, it's split into two sections. You have the header section and the, the body. Uh, where the header section just contains information about the run, the sample, uh, uh, um, and the, the body of the file uh, contains the actual sequences that were aligned along with their uh, position and quality. Um, okay, so since you know Sam and Dan, I'm not going to uh, uh, cover that, but I'll just go over uh, the header. So this is the kind of information that you uh, uh, will see in the, in the header. So you, you will see the tool, uh, in this example will be top hat, and the version number uh, that you use to align. Uh, you'll also see the reference uh, file that you use for the alignment, um, and uh, the, the list of chromosomes at beginning and end, all the context. And uh, the, the reads, you'll see the, the read group uh, identifier, where it will contain uh, the name of the sequencing center and the sample name, uh, and then uh, the, the the program uh, uh, version. Um, in the body, you will see uh, the, the, the following tags that I mentioned. You see the, the read name. Uh, these two are highlighted. I'll, 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 I'll go in depth uh, the flag and the cigar in a bit. Um, uh, you see the read name, the position, uh, the mapping quality, 
Uh, so you get a map of quality for the read itself, and you also get a breakdown of the uh, base quality for each one of the bases, as well as the quality uh, for, for that. Uh, you also get uh, the, 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 the length, length uh, which in this case will be 101, and the sequence, the actual sequence uh, that was uh, online. So, one of the, uh, the, the items that was highlighted was these uh, SAN or BAM flags. Uh, so this is uh, an 11-bitwise uh, flag, uh, which describes the alignment. Uh, and each one of the reads gets one of those uh, flags. So they're just a binary strength, uh, and uh, their length is 11, uh, length 11. And uh, it's a nice way, instead of having 11 columns in your file, it's like condensed into this one, uh, one number. Um, and it will give you information about whether or not, for example, the, uh, the read was unique, was it mapped to multiple places, is it the first read and the paired end or the second read, uh, was it, uh, did it not pass quality controls, is it a PCR artifact, um, and um, so how, how many of you have actually uh, tried to interpret or use satellites before? No. Okay, okay, so that's good. So maybe you'll take a chance now. If you check this website, uh, this is a nice uh, website where it gives you a form and then you tell it what you want. So what, what uh, description or what, what information you want for your read. And they tell you the flag uh, uh, number. Now, why is this useful? Let's say that you're looking to a MAM file and you're trying to pull all the reads that are uniquely mapped. So you will only want reads that are uniquely mapped in your MAM file. So actually you can use SAM tools, you can use SAM tools view, and then you give this flag to SAM tools, and we'll go and look through all the reads and pull the ones that have that score or that, that flag number. So uh, can we all try and go to uh, this, this page right now? And let's say that I'm interested in picking uh, the reads that are um, second that are mapped properly. And I want them to be uh, in read one. So I want them to be the first read, and I want that first read to be mapped properly. So what would that number be? Can you repeat it? Yeah, one more time. So yeah, so the two criteria that I want from my band file, I want uh, the read that is mapped properly, and it's uh, the first segment. So read one. The first. Okay, so good. So this, the, the link, if you're not typing it out directly, the link will be found in Module 9 Lecture. <clears throat> what page? So the 66 is represented in binary? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so you can put that number in the samples. You can say samples view dash f. Put that number and put the name of the BAM file, and we'll only pull reads that are uniquely mapped, and they, they are read from that file. Why do you want us to do that? So I, I just, was just, uh, I wanted to, to get the flag for reads that are uh, uniquely mapped, and they belong to read one. They're just read one, not read two. So what would, what would that flag, what would that number be? So this form that I'm pointing at right here, it helps you, instead of you sitting down and coming up with that number, it actually populates it for you. So you can say checkbox, you, you, you check what uh, criteria you're interested in, and it calculates that number for you. Um, and then you can take that number, and as I mentioned, you can use sample tools view. Uh, so there are two parameters in sample tools view, dash f, small f, and dash uh, uh, capital F. One that uh, where it only includes, so it pulls all the uh, reads that, that fit that criteria, or exclude this criteria. So you can use that to create a, a subset, or like a smaller BAM file if you want, that only includes reads with the criteria that you, you specify. So one example is that you've tried to filter the, the BAM file um, after the alignment, and you wanna, you wanna do some downstream analysis with it, you can uh, take, you, if you want just uniquely mapped tweets, then you can pass it through this filter, use this, and then get the filtered BAM, uh, and move on and do other th things with it. Okay. Um, 
Cigar string is another thing that you'll, you'll find within the NAND file. Sorry. Yes, yes. Sorry? Oh, it was 66, I think, right? Oh, yeah, sure, that's a good idea. All right. Here it is. Okay. Okay, so this is the oh, sorry. Oh. There. So what I wanted is I wanted to be properly paired and I wanted to be read one. Um, and then the number, the flag that I got was 66, so I can take that number and then I can uh, run it through SAM tools to subset my BAM files. Um, I don't know how accurate the PCR. Um, Obi, have you tried the PCR flag? I I haven't tried it. I I don't so I don't know how accurate it is in detecting PCR artifacts. used uh, in the alignment. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, so the cigar string is another string that you'll find in the band file, uh, and the, the, the cigar string actually tells you uh, how was the read uh, aligned, uh, and it tells you that kind of per base, uh, it will describe the, the alignment, so whether it was uh, it, it matched, for each one, for each base within your read, did it match, did it mis was it a mismatch, uh, was, it, was there an insertion, deletion, uh, uh, or was there a gap? Uh, uh, in the alignment. So if you take this example, you'll see this This is considered to be a cigar string. Uh, let's say if it was 100 bases, your read was 100 bases. Uh, this is saying that 81, the first 81 bases in your read matched. Then there was a gap of 859 bases in the reference. And then the last 19 bases matched. Um, so this is important because uh, this cigar string gets used by a lot of the tools that, uh, that we pass your BAM file uh, to. Uh, one example I can think of is GATK, not an RNA, but DNA. Uh, it tries to look for indels. Uh, it reads that indels and it tries to do realignment around indels. And this is one source where it looks for indels or potential indels uh, is through the cigar string. So it parses the cigar string. But other tools uh, take advantage of the cigar string and to find any patterns of insertion or deletions. Um, uh, uh, yes. You're taking brackets, I think you match all this match. Um, I thought it was just a match for them. I don't. Yeah, I don't know why it's a match. I'm pretty sure it should just be a match. 
Uh, but now the question is, how is n different from the equal sign? Say something like alignment match versus sequence match. Yeah, versus so sequence match, maybe it checks the original sequence. I don't know if it checks the fast Q sequence that you pass it. I don't, I'm not quite sure. It just passes the sequences to make sure that the base is the same as the... But it probably sometimes aligns sequences even though it's not a full match. So the so the eighty one match M that means that it has aligned the eighty one bases, even though maybe there are hundreds matches in the sequence. Okay. So that would be dashes then, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, maybe it's easier to find base. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a dash. Uh, a threshold. I, I don't know. I think you can only specify the number of mismatches when you're talking about alignment. Uh, but in terms of the gap, it really depends on the aligner. Uh, I'm trying to think if there is. Uh, because with top I you actually provided with the uh, uh, expected distance between the reads. So that's something that you, you give top hat. So uh, the question is now, does it look at that distance and anything that's beyond that distance, would it use it as a threshold to build the signal strength? That I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but there is, there is an, you can specify the number of mismatches. Uh, that's a, a, a threshold that we can specify there. Yeah. Uh, so that's the question. All right, so, um, and sometimes you don't want to look at the whole BAM file. So the BAM, BAM, BAM file you will contain information about all the chromosomes, uh, the, the, the whole transcriptome uh, data. But if you're interested in a specific exon or a specific gene, what you will end up uh, doing is that uh, you will use what's called a BAM, a BAM file. Um, and you can use that BAM file to subset your BAM file as well. So let's say that you're only interested in gene that's from the BAM file, and you want to create a subset, uh, or you want to look at the coverage across that gene. You want to see how many weights cover that gene, or the exons in that gene. So what you can do is you can create a little text file called BED, bed file, and the BED file contains information like the chromosome of the region you're interested in, the, uh, the start position, and the end position. So it could be, it doesn't have to be a gene, it could be anything any region that you're interested in the genome um, that has chromosome start and end. And you can use uh, tools, and the tools will request a bed file so that you can uh, look at the coverage uh, across the regions that you specified in your uh, bed file. Um, and those uh, tools, like SAM tools, you, so you can have samples, uh, bed, bed files to do that. There's BAM tools, uh, Picard, all these tools accept uh, BAM uh, uh, files uh, that, that can be used to manipulate uh, BAM files. And in terms of BEDs, you can actually use the BEDs. If you have two BED files, uh, um, you can look at the overlap between the two BED files. Uh, say you have two regions, uh, if you're doing target sequencing, uh, using two capture methods, and you want to see what the overlap between the two targets are. So you'll get one BED file from one target, or another bed file from another target, you can use bed tools or uh, uh, bed ops uh, to calculate the overlap or uh, uh, come up with an intersect or unique regions in one versus the other. So there's so much you can do with uh, bed files uh, using these uh, tools. Um, so after the alignment, what you usually do, the first step is uh, sorting uh, the BAM file. So there are two ways you can sort the band file. You can sort the band file either by the coordinates or you can sort them by the reading. And depending on what you're doing after the alignment, uh, uh, sometimes uh, you need to sort by position because um, if you're doing any uh, processing uh, using another tool, uh, they, they require you to sort by position because it will make it easier for the lab tool to grab reads uh, if they're sorted by position. Uh, but however, if you're trying to look for something like the, uh, uh, the distance between the two reads, uh, that requires the two uh, read one and read two to be in the same exact order, 
the, the reads, then you need to sort by read name instead of position. Because if you sort by position, you might lose that, uh, uh, the, the order of read one and read two. Uh, but if you sort by read name, line, the fifth line and read, uh, and the first uh, band of read one will match the fifth line in, uh, uh, in the second uh, of read two band file. Uh, and again, when it comes to visualization, you can use IGV, uh, where you can load uh, like a, 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 some a UCSC G track, uh, load your BAM file. Uh, the, the, the coverage track on the top will tell you how many uh, reads cover uh, those regions, and you can log transform that track. Um, so uh, here, and, and those chunks represent uh, reads. Any gray line represents uh, gaps in the alignment, and um, the color of the read uh, tells you the strand that it comes from. You can also change the color of those reads to reflect the quality of the read. Uh, so uh, that's something else that you can uh, you can do. Uh, so again, uh, there are a couple of biostars uh, discussions uh, about alternative uh, to uh, IGB. Uh, there's a list of uh, tools that you can you can use. I uh, mainly use IGB. I use IGB uh, not to assess the quality of the band, but for, for example, if you're interested in uh, a gene that's differentially expressed between the two, we get a list of genes that are differentially expressed. The first thing that we do is go back to IGB just to make sure that uh, the regions around those genes uh, look, looks okay and it wasn't a technical or it wasn't picked up by due to a technical uh, error. So uh, look at those genes. You can actually do two panels if you're looking at cancer and normal. You can do two, uh, two panels uh, right above each other and do direct comparison in terms of the coverage and the expression between the two genes or the two regions. Um, before I get into the QC assessment, any questions so far? No? Okay. I hope that means that everything is good. <laughs> All right. So uh, the second part of this module is the QC assessment. So here I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the main uh, parameters that we look at to uh, say whether or not a library needs to be resequenced uh, or needs to be sent back to the, uh, to the lab. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the three, three prime, five prime bias, bias, how you find it, how that affects uh, downstream analysis, look at the nucleotide content, um, uh, read quality, uh, base quality uh, distributions, uh, PCR artifact, how to deal with it, uh, sequencing depth, the base distribution, and the insert size distribution. So um, one of the first things that I, I check for when I look at the, uh, the RNA-seq RNA library is the distribution of the coverage across the, the genes. So um, these plots are generated by a, a tool called RSeq. Uh, I highly, I highly recommend it. It's really easy to use. Um, so what this, what this does, it takes um, uh, the, the med file of all uh, your genes. Uh, sorry, the top ten, uh, the top thousand expressed genes in your file, and then it, it looks at the, uh, the, the the genes, they will have different lengths for sure. Um, then what it does is that it normalizes the, each one of these uh, genes by splitting it into 100 uh, bits. So that what we're trying to do is we're trying to normalize for the length. So you split each one into 100, 100 bits uh, from the, uh, the 5 prime to the 3 prime end. And then you look at the coverage for each one of these bits, the coverage distribution uh, of these bits. And you're assuming that the top thousand express genes will give you a good representation of the overall uh, coverage distribution for the rest of the genes. So in here, what we're seeing, we're seeing a pattern. We're seeing some samples that have, they seem to have, so, so on the x-axis you have the five prime to three prime, the normalized uh, uh, gene coverage, uh, gene, sorry, position. And then on the y-axis you have the coverage. Uh, so these samples over here, they seem to be performing well. There is an even coverage across the, the, the transcript. However, these samples, they seem to have a, a huge three prime bias. So there is so much coverage at the three prime end of the, uh, the transcript over uh, the other end. 
So this is something that you have to be very careful with. What do I do? Do I normalize? Uh, do I normalize or correct for it? Should we send it back to check? This could be because of a kit that you're using to prepare a library, so you might consider changing the kit. Um, but you have, we have to look. You know, have to look into it. Um, correcting it might not be the easiest uh, thing to do, so it's better to go back to the root and figure out what caused uh, caused this. If you keep it, then uh, it will for sure will influence the expression estimation of your data because uh, long uh, uh, genes, very long genes, will be severely affected. They will have, they will be, the expression will be underestimated, while very short genes, the expression will be uh, overestimated because of this uh, this bias. So one way you can also check for it is after you do the expression, you can do a plot, expression versus gene length. And if you see a correlation between the expression and gene length, like as the gene length is increasing, the expression is going down, then that's, that's another confirmation that maybe there is some sort of bias in terms of the coverage. So that would be the first thing that I would check for, coverage distribution. Is it possible that that means that like these are two groups caused by the different expression level? No, because here I'm looking at uh, the thousand, top thousand expressed genes. So what are the chances that the thousand genes are in one network? That doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, if you were looking at maybe a small subset, then even if you're looking at a small subset, you shouldn't be seeing uh, 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 an even coverage that is uh, five prime, three prime related. If there is a biological uh, a difference, then the whole expression should be lower. It's not just shouldn't be a, a case of general direction. So this is the programmatic. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's one question. Yeah. Is the input for the back tools which form the back files? For these? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the the back files use the. Um, I think they use GTF files. So the genome. Yeah, so which, which you can download from uh, UCSC, so you can download that. It, it's just a, a file that lists all the genes, uh, start and, and gene name. Uh, and I guess you can provide it with your own if you don't have it. Like if you can't you can find it, then you can make your own. Any other questions? Yes. So the bed file is used to look at uh, uh, all the genes, because they look at the top uh, thousand expressed genes. So it's just a way to, uh, to, to annotate the, the, the regions. Uh, so, um, but it actually looks at your uh, band. It looks at your band file. So if I go to use this program, this software, yeah. I well, you're not uploading. You can run it on your local machine or like on the server. Yeah. So you need a BAM file and you need an annotation file. So in both the BAM file and the annotation file. Uh, the annotation, as I said, you can download from UCSC, and the BAM file we have available. And this is not included in the FASTQC report. Uh, I don't believe so. They yeah. should condense them. They should because I think FASTQC is designed. Oh, because FASTQC is pre-aligned. Right? I mean, you can run FASTQC after alignment, but I think FASTQC was designed to provide quality metrics for the FASTQ at the FASTQ level, which does not include any uh, alignment. And it's something, if you don't really want to use this tool, you can uh, calculate on your own. I mean, you can just look at the, uh, the coverage for the genes, uh, the two ends. And as I said, if you don't want to do it at the band level, you can do it at the expression level by looking at the read length versus the expression to see if they Analysis, we can drop some sample. Okay, by analysis, okay, this particular sample is you know doesn't matching or having really bad library, and I should drop it. Is it uh, after this analysis, or how do we how do we you know go through our alignment? Okay, uh, this particular sample is really you know messed up, and I should drop it. How, how, how we can make some conclusion? So well, like in this example. This is Oh, the question was, uh, at what point do you decide whether or not you should drop the samples and not uh, continue with them? It really depends on how severe that, uh, I mean, there isn't, there isn't a certain num one number that I use as a, as a threshold when I assess the quality of the library. So I don't go, oh, this number is more than 0.6, then I'm going to drop it completely. 
So uh, when I assess that, I look at all the metrics that I mentioned above. And then I make a judgment after looking at all, all, all the metrics. You can train, like if, if you want to um, uh, train your model, so you can look at all these metrics and then look at everything you've done and what you failed and what you have flat passed, and then come up with some sort of a statistical model to train to train it so that every time you pass it a sample, it will do it for you. But for now, I mean, if you don't have that expertise, you can just look at it and assess how severe, uh, how severe it is. Um, uh, this to me is, uh, is severe. But again, you look at multiple uh, metrics, not just uh, uh, this. Um, and then see, I mean, if you do the expression analysis or a preliminary expression analysis, see if there's any batch effects or if that batch stands out compared to the other ones. And if it does, then that tells you you should really consider doing something about it. And if you really, really, really can't do anything about it, then at least you should let people be aware of such a thing so that when they include it in their data analysis, they can at least incorporate this into their models and then... Um, and try to correct for it somehow. Um, the second uh, uh, metric that I look at is the uh, nucleotide uh, content uh, distribution. So you expect, um, uh, after sequencing, to have uh, a, a uniform distribution of the four bases, A, C, G, T. There shouldn't be an overrepresentation of a, of a base uh, uh, or in your reads, at least. Um, so one of the plots that we generate is the position uh, of the read, so from uh, the, the first position to um, uh, the hundredth position, or in this case, it's 35 bases long, um, and then the nucleotide uh, frequency. So you expect them to be uniform and, and along the 25% uh, level. Uh, here, you, you see some uh, sometimes a pattern where the, uh, the, the that actually is a stir AC fluctuation in the, in the ACGT uh, distributions for the first 10 bases. And um, that is actually uh, expected. Um, there's a paper by Luna. Um, it turns out that it's the, the random uh, primers that are used. Uh, they tend to uh, 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 cause these certain patterns at the five ends of the reads. So one way you can deal with it is you can trim the first few bases of your read. Uh, so that it doesn't, this doesn't affect uh, your read. So again, plot it, see if you actually have such a thing, if you do that, uh, trim the, 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 the first uh, few bases. And you will notice that if you do have this problem, then it will be systematic, and you'll see it in all the samples, not in some samples, but not in others. If they're all done with, uh, uh, if they all had random priming uh, done or uh, the Illumina, then they should have that issue. Sorry. Sorry. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, it will probably affect your alignment. In fact, what's the impact of this on your alignment? So it might affect your alignment uh, because if the bases are not correct, they are not they're synthetic bases, then it might affect, so it might increase the uh, number of bases that mismatch. Um, so yeah, so by turning them, it will uh, enhance. Well, I turned them, it did enhance, but I don't have a number for you, like by what percentage it enhanced the alignment. Uh, Yes. Is it like is it an approach that you take to turn six base pairs of the pipeline all the time? Because I see this all the time. I see, yeah, so I do that now. So now that's something that I do. Uh, but keep keep checking. I mean, um, but it's it's a it's a sequencing thing, so you will see it in all the samples. And you said six base pairs. So it's actually like ten. Like if you see here, it's it's right. It's one to ten. Range. But I don't want to provide a number uh, because it could be uh, different depending on the technology that you use or the sequences that you use. So first check before you decide which basis to choose. Sorry, which yes. is uh, sample by sample or you apply this automatically to all your samples? I do it automatically to all my samples. Because then if some samples don't have this problem, which I assume most of them have, yeah. but if some are not, then you're trimming. Yeah, linear. so if some samples don't have that problem, then I would be concerned because uh, it should be a sequencing thing and not a sample that so this only for the primer, the only for the primer part. Uh, the primer is not sequenced now. Okay, so the, so you're actually getting rid of the well. Um, it's it's the random primer that 
that causes this issue, but these are not the targets themselves. Yes? So, uh, you know, I understand that there's biases towards amplification for things that are maybe GC rich on the end, or if these spaces are, uh, you know, the sequences are erroneously GC rich. Yeah, I think it's I think it's it's affecting the the uh, the, the bases more than it's not it's not even the actual primary bases, but it's affecting the distribution of the uh, the bases that are being synthesized or being um, added at those level one we do. It's um, it's a library. It's not the sequencing, but it's a library problem. Process. That's why you do the random. What do we in case A D content is greater than G C content? Because I see before alignment, sometimes A N T content is greater than G C content. Yeah. When you're looking at the overall content, right? Here we're looking at like positions at the beginning of the read, not like the overall content of all the reads. This is systematic and always happens at the same at the start of the read. Yeah. Um, Another thing uh, you can look at is the, uh, the, the quality distribution. So we're looking at the distribution of the quality per base, so the base uh, alignment uh, quality. Um, and again, on the x-axis you have the position, so base is 1 to 35, because it's the 35 base uh, uh, need. Um, and on the y-axis we have what's called the FRED quality score. So you will get to hear that often when you deal with quality scores and uh, align the line file. Uh, thread quality is simply the negative 10 times log 10 of P, where P is the probability that the base calling is wrong. Um, so for example, if you have a, a, a thread score of 30, it means that you have a 1 in a thousand chance that the base calling is wrong. The higher the, the thread score, the better that is. It's the, the less the chances that your base calling is wrong. Um, so usually, people when they assess the quality, they say uh, anything above 30 is considered good. So uh, you look at reads that have an overall quality of uh, uh, Q30 or that sort of 30. Um, and then we look at the, uh, uh, the, the distribution, you'll notice that the, uh, here the quality is, is very high overall. I mean, everything is above uh, Q30, which is good. Uh, but you see a slight drop in, in, in the quality. The end of the read. And that's uh, that's completely normal. It's uh, just the way that um, uh, the sequencing it accumulates error as you you go. Uh, so by the end of the read, you have your error profile is a bit higher than the end. But we shouldn't expect uh, a, a, a huge drop where uh, it's below Q30 because that will uh, that will be a very high error profile at the end of the read. And you don't you don't want that. So if it's really really low uh, at the end of your read, then you consider also trimming your read at the end. So you only include part of the read that has high quality. Yeah. And most of the you know, sequencing platform uh, tells us okay, this is you know in the high uh, one part eight, and it will give first first thirty two. Yeah. So in case we don't know the sequencing platforms, is there any way that we can find out what is the quality score or thread score of this particular data? Uh, you mean the, the type of the, uh, the quality score or the quality itself? Quality itself. Um, Sorry, that's a question. Is there a way you can find out what the quality score is irrelevant if you don't know what the sequencing uh, yeah, platform is? Platform. Well, the um, I believe there are two different types of uh, quality scores. Well, you're talking. I think you're talking about the fast, the fast uh, I'm talking about the, when, when the particular data is belongs to thread 33 plus or 64 plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think for that you have to look at the distribution of your quality score, and then look at the minimum and the max, and okay. see if the max matches uh, either or. Uh, but also, what you can do is a lot of tools nowadays they they are able to recognize that because they do that for you. They look at the quality distribution, and then they tell you, they predict with the, uh, with the so you don't have to worry about that.
Um, something else we talked about earlier uh, in the day, the PCR uh, duplication, and whether or not uh, you should, you should uh, collapse or get rid of uh, duplicates. Uh, again, DNA-seq, one of the metrics that we look at is the number of reads per start, start point. Uh, and ideally, you want to have one read for each start point. So here, what we do is we just take uh, uh, the, the, all the reads and, and count all the reads at a specific start point and then see how many we have. So you, what you want is you don't want reads that pile up the same start and end. You want uh, reads that actually overlap uh, the, the region. Um, however, in, uh, again, in RNA, the, uh, this is not uh, uh, completely random. The start and the end, they actually uh, correlate with the transcript start and end, so it's not completely random, just like uh, DNA. Uh, but the tool does generate uh, a plot for you that checks both the, uh, the position, so the beginning of the first read to the end of the second read, and also the, uh, the, the actual sequence of itself, to check if the sequence is exactly the same. Uh, and it generates a, a, a plot. So it's one way that you can visualize uh, this PCR or transcript uh, artifact, and then based on that, it's up to you whether you want to collapse or not collapse. But if you have something that is extreme, then you might want to consider. Uh, do you remember that? Oh, sorry. So, um, so this is. Number of reads. I'm trying to remember the Oculus uh, uh, of the read. Uh, so, how many times you see reads that are exactly the same? So, you take a, a, a read, and ideally, what you want is you want reads that are so most of them you only see once. But for example, you see uh, some reads that are. 300, uh, uh, presented 300 times. But I thought the y-axis is number of reads. Sorry, number of reads, but this is how... Same so like like the reads. Reads. Yeah, so reads. Reads. Right? So you have 1,000 number of reads on the y-axis. Yeah. Or is that the base, like the size of the read? No, 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 it's... Um, I'm trying to remember the, what, what this, how do they define the occupant of the read. But this is what we want our plot to look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but no, you have to, you have to understand how it was uh, generated. Because um, I'm trying to think, the that the, the plot actually, the curve goes like right here. No, I, I remember what, uh, actually, I can, we'll check right now. It's the duplication time. So, so, oops. Yeah. 
So here they're saying the first column is uh, occurrence or duplication time, times. So how many times that sequence was duplicated? That exact sequence with the same uh, start and end. How many times that sequence was duplicated? Sorry. So there are two. Yeah. So there. Yeah. Lock times. So there are two y-axes. There's the. They tell you the number of reads and the percentage of reads, of of your total reads. Yeah. yeah. Just one. So those are unique reads, and that's what you want. You want to maximize the ones that are uh, low. So you want you want this whole thing to be really low because you want to uh, minimize the the number of reads that are duplicated. Um, but when you get a bad library, you'll get something like this, where at high occurrence or high duplication rate, you will see a lot of reads at that rate. Yes. Oh, so the duplication uh, rate is measured two ways. So uh, they, they look at the position for the, the mapping duplication, and then they look at the sequence for the sequence duplication. So they look if the sequence is exactly the same, or if the, uh, the just the, ma the mapping, uh, um, the, the beginning of the read and the end of the read. Because you could have mismatches uh, introduced. So, so usually they're correlated. I mean, if you have the, the, the mapping and the sequence, they they are correlated. And in this, it's saying that eleven percent of the reads are in this plot. It's saying eleven percent of the reads are in the range of about one unique. Yeah, but I think it's a cumulative, right? Like you're gonna have to add each percentage yeah. to come up with hundred percent. Add each number to get hundred percent. Okay. Yes, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So we're not doing any collapsing here. No, no. I yeah. Know, I yeah. Know, but to say you know, RNA want to, to to eliminate them and DNA want to eliminate them. I think it's it's more than that. It has to be with the death and with the different schema. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. yeah. So all of these. Yeah. 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 You have to think about the expectations for your system. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so expectation uh, is, is a big factor because here we have expectation that we're dealing here, dealing with human data, uh, I am dealing with uh, aligned RNA seq data of a certain length, two by one and one, versus uh, against the whole genome reference. So all of these plots are based on this scenario. So these will change if you use a different scenario, if you use a transcriptomic reference, if you're using a de novo uh, assembly. Yes. Sorry. You put a prop So yeah, so again, I don't. I don't, uh, I don't want to give you any cutoffs. I don't personally do a cutoff, uh, especially with this plot, because we don't collapse um, uh, RNA and seq data, but I put it out there to visualize the impact. And if it's really high, then I go back and investigate and ask, why is this different from the other samples that we've seen? How come it's much higher than everything else that we, we've done? Uh, but we, I don't do any collapsing, or I don't have any cutoffs. Like What's the number? Yeah, I, uh, I again, I don't, I don't know, but it usually looks like this. And I've seen some bad samples that have been eliminated where. 
Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't have that number on top of my head, so I guess it's. Yeah. 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 Because again, I can't really distinguish whether it's a, a PCR or an expression, so I can't give you because that will highly depend on the region we're looking at, the gene. Um, so I don't, I don't. I can't really give a specific number. What time is the break? Oh, 15 minutes, OK. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, sequencing gap. So uh, again, this is another topic that we, uh, we discussed uh, earlier uh, in the day. Uh, is the question, uh, I get that question a lot. Have we sequenced enough? How much sequencing do we need to do? Uh, how many reads? Uh, do we how many lanes? Um, so just to add to the discussion that we had earlier, one way that uh, I, I look at it is uh, by using a saturation plot. So what is a saturation plot? Um, we take the bat file after it was aligned, and then we try to re randomly sample at different levels. So we sample 10% of the reads, 20% um, of the reads, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100% of the reads. And then in each random sample, we calculate the number of splice junctions, known splice junctions and novel splice junctions. And then we do this plot. And what you expect to see is that at some level, the number of reads that you're adding, they're not really adding that much information anymore. So you get to a point where no matter how many reads you add, you've already discovered all the splice junctions that are known. Um, now, the rates of growth of the lines are going to be different between the known junction and the novel junctions. Because novel junctions, they could be false positives as well, um, because of the, the, the splice detection tool that we use. So they might not saturate as fast as the known junction, and that is, that's okay, because again, there is a lot of high positive, uh, false positive rates uh, in the splice junctions. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the known junctions here, um, you look at where it uh, saturates. In this plot, I don't have, I haven't put the, the number of number of reads in the 100%. Uh, but usually, when you look at the saturation, you say, okay, well, maybe around like 40 or 50% was, was sufficient. So you can do like a pilot study where you do one lane, two lane, three lanes of sequencing for one sample do that and see, did I do too much? Did I do too little? Um, so that's one way of kind of assessing how much we really need um, for that. But again, this is uh, using slice junction. Um, if you're using it for a completely different purpose, like if you want to do variant calling that, uh, on the RNAC data, then you might look at just the, the number of weeks that cover that site they're interested in. Um, and you might not want to do this method. Um, base distribution. So here I'm looking at the uh, number of bases or the percentage of bases that belong to the coding region, non-coding region, ribosomal. Um, so that's that's very important because uh, the, the different library techniques that you use will yield different uh, distributions or different charts. So for example, if you're doing whole transcriptome libraries, you expect the distribution to have more uh, non-coding uh, regions versus, uh, or more ribosomal uh, compared to uh, poly A uh, mRNA uh, libraries. So with the poly A, you expect the uh, coding regions to be uh, a lot more the, than the whole transcriptome. And if, you, if those proportions are messed up, when you look at the QC report, you might want to go back again and check the, the library technique uh, to make sure that was uh, done properly. Uh, one concept that I want to also introduce uh, that will come up later in the assignment integrated assignment tonight is the uh, naming uh, uh, or definitions of uh, fragments versus inserts versus intermate uh, uh, size. Um, 
so these terms are used uh, interchangeably, and it can be confusing because sometimes they're actually misused. Um, when I'm talking about uh, fragments, here I'm talking about uh, the distance from the uh, beginning of read one to the end of read two, and that includes the uh, adapters. So the, uh, it's the, the, the fragment size includes the whole length. Uh, when I'm talking about insert size, I'm just talking about the, the distance from uh, the beginning of read one to the end of read two. This, and the insert size does not include uh, adapters. And the inner mate is the inner distance that separates the, the, the two reads. And this actually top hat asks you to estimate what the inner distance or expected inner distance is when you run, when you run it. And this um, information you usually uh, get from the library. So people who construct the library, uh, they, 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 they cut that segment out of the gel. So they, they have an estimation, uh, an idea of what the mean uh, uh, size is. So after you do the alignment, you can look at the distribution uh, of the insert size or the fragment size or the inner distance size, depending on what you pick to, to, to plot. And, and after you do that, you look at the mean and then you check with the, um, with the lab to see if it's consistent with what you were expecting uh, uh, when, after library prep. Um, and finally, uh, this is uh, just a snapshot from IGB. This is one way where you can look at variants. Um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, tools that you can use to call variants. Um, I'm not aware of tools that you can use to call variants on RNA-C specifically, um, but um, uh, you can use, now you can use GATK, the, the, the new version of GATK allows you to call SNV, shortly for the variance from uh, RNA data. So anyway, another way you can do SAM tools pile up, what that does, it goes to every single base in your uh, data, and it tries to calculate the frequency uh, of the bases for each base. So it'll tell you this many, uh, uh, this many bases supported the uh, reference, and this many pieces supported the alternate, if there is a, a variation. So you can use that to calculate the frequency. Or you can, um, if you know of certain sites that you're expecting to see variation, for example, you've done an experiment at the, at the DNA seq level, you already know all the SMDs or the variants in the DNA, and you want to uh, find the concordance in the RNA seq data. So you take those variants and you go to IGD, you open it up, put the position of that variant, and then see the uh, distribution of the bases. So here, for example, we're seeing uh, that the, the reference is C, but reads, um, there are reads that have uh, a T, uh, so this is a, a variation in your, that's present in your RNA. Uh, if you want to calculate the frequency, you can simply just count the number of Ts divided by the total number of reads that cover that spot, and that will tell you what the mutation frequency is at that specific site. Um, but you can do that, you can do IGD for all of your RNA bases. So you might want to run it through some call of a, some sort of a caller before you do that. All right, so, so this is, um, so I think in the next module, uh, Obi is going to take you through um, some, so everything talked about the uh, top hat. So, so far you have generated task few files. I think the last thing that was done is Maybe fast QC was generated, maybe not. Uh, but you can take those fast Q uh, and then go through uh, adapter trimming, uh, alignment, and uh, uh, possibly some post uh, alignment QC. And that will be the end of today. And then I guess we'll go for dinner. And then uh, we can work on when we come back. I'm here at 6 to 8 working on the integrated assignment. So, in the integrated assignment, it will be the same uh, uh, style as uh, the stuff that we did during the day, but I'm working on a completely different data set, also another uh, chromosome. Um, and then you get the chance to download the data, go through it yourself, I'll be around, I can assist you with anything. Uh, and we'll do the same thing, we'll do uh, uh, the alignment today, and then we'll leave the expression for tomorrow. Thank you. you. Yeah, yes, any further questions regarding the duplication or anything else before we go?
elaborate a little bit more on the and pile up um, and what you actually get out of that. And yeah. How you get from there to uh, like sharing the group. Yeah. So with NPILOP, uh, what, uh, what you do is that um, it goes through every single, you provide with a task file, which is a, like a, a reference, a sequence reference file, and you provide it with your BAM file. And then what it does, it takes every base in your reference, and it goes to the BAM file, and then it looks at that base, and looks at the distribution of bases. So you end up with a file uh, that has, uh, if, if the human genome will have three billion rows, uh, one, uh, one base per row, and then it will tell you a breakdown of all the bases. So it will tell you at this base I saw uh, the reference was A, but I saw uh, five A's and three G's and one C. And then I think you need to take that and then run some sort of a, like a, a summary. So go through it, figure out which ones are uh, variant, or which ones are variant, and then you can calculate the frequencies, like they're variant by this frequency, they're above this frequency threshold, and then select all of these, and then yeah, those are your variants. It's the problem with that is that it occupies so much space because you're doing that per sample. Uh, I don't know if you can run pileup for multiple samples. Sure you can. Like if you run for multiple samples and you get one file and you get one column per sample, uh, but it, it occupies so much space and it takes a, like it takes a long time. So you might want to, and, and you don't have to do it for uh, the whole genome. I mean, you can provide a subset uh, faster reference. If you are uh, looking at certain regions or you capture something and you only want the to be one. Sure. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. 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 And then, yeah, and the alignment. Oh. Here. So uh, he was asking, uh, uh, how come we see negative inner distance? Uh, and I wish I had a board that I, I would sketch. There's a board right there. Oh, there it is. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Okay, so let's assume that your library size is 250 bases that you're trying to sequence. And you have, uh, you're doing paired in sequencing and you're doing uh, two, two 100 uh, uh, bases, uh, so 100 bases uh, each. So you expect the distance between the rays to be 50, correct? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Now, let's say that um, the fragment was 200 that we provided in the lab. You do sequencing. You still do 2 by 100 because that's what you usually do. Um, you're going to end up with 0. The, the distance between the two is 0. Now, sometimes you end up with, or if you get very small, so fragment size. And, and think of it as a distribution. It's the distribution. So you will get some uh, uh, fragments that are shorter than the, the, the sum of your two, two reads. So in this case, what will happen is that you will, there will be some, some overlap. Um, and then the shorter it is, the more the overlap will be until you get actually 100% overlap. Now, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. 
Exactly. Well, you're not really, yeah, so you are losing kind of because you're actually covering that area twice, right? Um, so ideally what you want is you, you want the fragment size to be big enough so that you um, you have some inner distance and you don't want the base to overlap. And the other thing is, um, I don't think it affects the expression, but I don't know how it affects uh, variance. So maybe if there is a, 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 a variant call in the overlap, and you're trying to call, you're getting, you're not actually getting two reads. These two reads are coming from the same fragment. So they're not two independent reads. Uh, so it's, it's best if you actually have two reads that are coming from two separate pairs. That will be more uh, proof that the variant exists versus two reads that belong to the same pair. So ideally you want uh, to uh, check that first. So check, first check what the library, expected library size is and then decide on doing whether you want to do 100 uh, bases or not. But the problem is, I think, nowadays, is when you do the sequencing, um, and you don't do it for just one sample, you're doing it for multiple samples, and usually you let the, you let the instrument run 100 bases. So you can't really stop it for the other samples. If you have that capability, you don't do 100 to, I don't know. I think it is not So you take your back file, after you align it, um, and you sample from the back. So let's say that your back file, 100%, just a complete back file, has, um, let's say, 300 million reads. Okay? So, or let's, let's keep it simple, let's say 100 million reads, your full back file. Then you start sampling from your back. So you take, we randomly sample 10%, 20%, 30%, and you generate new back files. So at the end, you have, let's say you have 10 back files that range from um, 10 million to 100 million. And then for each one of these back files, you're looking at the number of junctions that you see in that back file. Known or not. So you, you check a, a, a SPICE uh, database to see how many of those junctions are actually reported, or have been reported. And and that's what you calculate. You calculate the, uh, the, the number, of, or, or, uh, or just the number, not the percentage, uh, the number. Ideally, what you want to see is that you want to see some saturation. And the saturation is going to happen at some point, because at some point, when you add extra sequences, it's not going to add information, because you've already detected everything that can be detected. Does that make sense? Right, but then so you will get saturation close to 100% or something. Right? Yeah. What's the perfect ideal curve you're looking for? Isn't there, like, yeah. there is no, I mean, there is no perfect ideal. You're just looking at approximately. So that's a good question. Sometimes, like if you do, if you start with a small number of uh, reads, you're never going to see saturation. Like there will, will be points. So the point behind this is that you do a, a very deep, uh, you do, as, as I suggested, two or three lanes for just one time. Before you start the project. And then you want to see approximately how many reads do we need to saturate. And then you can apply, you take that number and then apply it for the samples that you, that you have. Can we put another amount of sequencing or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so it is like that you should be doing number of lanes versus read depth in the depth Pretty much. So read depth is number of lanes. Because you, 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 the more lanes you sequence, the more the depth of that sample. So, yeah, you just give us uh, three samples of three samples. Sorry, three? 
because we have the three series. So oh, so yeah, so there's the, I, I split them. So I'm looking at the novel junctions, so any new junctions that we haven't seen before. We're looking at known junctions, or junctions that have been reported before uh, in, in databases. And all, which is a combination of these two. So this is pretty much the addition of these two. So if you're, if you're really looking for novel junctions, then you would, like, it could happen that for novel junctions you have a different number of lanes. For so sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're looking for novel junctions, it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for novel junctions, you probably end up you know, needing to sequence more than you are for uh, known junctions. And, um, Um, yeah. So basically, it's like uh, for testing step, you you want to determine you may just use one sample or two sample to determine what kind of sequence step you need for your whole project. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, you might want to look for two samples just in case you want sample. We're going to go on a break, so if you're